Okay, folks, now we can get into the issue of simplifying square roots. And so the key to doing this is to recognize uh, expressions that are raised to the nth power inside of an nth root. So, for example, we can recognize that the number 81 is the same thing as 9 squared. And what's unique about this uh, squared is that matches the index of this radical here. So the index of that radical is 2. Likewise, x squared is already written, excuse me, x squared is already written as a perfect square. So that'll just be x squared. Then we have this factor y cubed, which we could think of as a y squared times another factor of y. That's using our property of exponents. And lastly, we could say that z to the fifth, there's lots of ways we could write it. Um, for example, I could write it as z squared times z squared uh, times z. But I'm going to go ahead and write it as z squared squared. Okay. All right. So now I'm ready to go ahead and simplify this root by, by one way people think about it is pulling out perfect squares. So I can go ahead and say that this would be equal to the square root of 9 squared times the square root of x squared times the square root of y squared times the square root of y and then times the square root of z squared squared and the square root of z. By the way, I, I dropped one of these z's here. That was the z squared times z squared. That's where I get z squared squared, but I should still have that factor of z there. So what I've done is I've distributed the, this is using the uh, product property from above here that says nth roots distribute over multiplication. So I went ahead and besides writing each of these terms in terms of each of these uh, factors in terms of perfect squares, I went ahead and distributed the square root over each factor. So notice that this first one, the square root of 9 squared, that just simplifies to be 9. The square root of x squared, careful here, I didn't assume that the variables are positive, so I need the absolute value of x on that. Here I have a square root of y squared. Again, that would be the absolute value of y. Um, and then I'm going to leave a square root of y in there. There's nothing I can do with that. And then the square root of z squared squared would just simplify to be the absolute value of z squared. And then I have a square root of z. So if I rearrange things, what I have is 9, absolute value x, absolute value y, absolute value z squared times the square root of yz. Now there's something I can do here. The absolute value of z squared, well, z squared is always going to be non-negative, so I don't need the absolute value on that expression. So this comes out to be 9 absolute value of x, absolute value of y, z times the square root of yz. And now I've simplified that radical. So let's look at number two here. In this problem, in part one, I was looking for all of my perfect squares. What am I going to do here? I'm going to look for all of my perfect cubes. So in this case, I could rewrite the number 81 as, um, well, 81 is 3 to the fourth power. So I could rewrite that as 3 cubed times 3. Likewise, I could, I've got y cubed. That's already a perfect, uh, perfect cube. And I could take my z squared, which, or excuse me, my z to the seventh, which would be z to the seventh is the same thing as z um, squared to the third power times z. Notice that if I use my properties of exponents, z squared cubed is the same as z to the sixth times z. So I end up with z to the seventh. So now I'm ready to clean this up. The cube root of 81x squared y cubed uh, z to the seventh would be the same thing as, here I have this perfect cube Right? And in my proper my square root product properties, I could distribute over the two terms, and this one would simplify. So that gives me a 3 out in front. And uh, I could also pull out my y, which was a perfect cube. So you get 3y. And then that would leave me with uh, uh, this z squared as well. And then I'm left with inside my perfect cube, I'm left with my, two fact my one factor of 3 that remains, my two factors of x that remained. There was no perfect cubes that could be pulled out there. I pulled out all the perfect cubes with, and, and that left nothing left for the y. And I was left with one factor of z when I pulled out the perfect cubes there. So there is our solution to Roman numeral 2. Okay. 
Folks, these might be a little bit harder than the ones you've done before. If you find this absolute value component challenging, that's okay. It's your first time maybe working with it. We're going to continue to work with it um, over the course of your math career, so you will get better at it. But notice here, because I have an even root, when I pull out perfect squares of variables, they have to come out with absolute value symbols. But here, because I have an odd root, when I pull out uh, perfect cubes of variables, they can just come out without the absolute value symbol. That has to do with our result from the previous page here, which says if you're simplifying the nth root of x to the n, it's the absolute value x if, x is e if, if n is even. And the nth root of x to the n just simplifies to x if n is odd. And we had a discussion, a series of examples that hopefully explored that. So I'm going to let you two, uh, I'm going to let you try these next two problems. Um, so go ahead and pause the video, give them a shot. So let's go ahead and continue. Looking at Roman numeral five, here we're multiplying two roots together. Now, um, in this case, what I'm going to do is use my distributive property of roots in reverse. So normally we've looked at this product, we've said that, okay, the square root of a times b is the square root of a times the square root of b, and we sort of worked the property in this direction. We looked at, we had a single root, and we had the product of a and b, and we, and we thought about distributing the root over the multiplication sign between those two. In this case, we've got two roots, and we're actually going to uh, combine them underneath the same root, so sort of doing that distributive property in reverse. So what we'd have here is that the square root of 5x times the square root of 20x cubed, by the way, I could do some cleaning up with that right now, but I'm going to hold off, that would be equal to the square root of 100 uh, x to the fourth power using this product property. So then uh, distributing the square root over the constant 100, and over the variable x to the fourth, the square root of 100 would give me 10, and then the square root of x to the fourth would come out as the absolute value of x squared. In this case, because I'm pulling out an x squared from here, the absolute value of x squared, that's, well, x squared's always gonna be positive, and so here, if I left the, I can leave the absolute value off uh, because this expression is always positive. So let's take a look at this uh, problem here. Here we've got the cube root of three times the square root of 10, and all of that's being raised to the fourth power. So I wanna warn you about this. These may not be combined. Over here, we use this root product property. And in this case, we, we were able to do so because both these roots had an index of two. They were both square roots. This is a cube root, this is a square root, so I cannot use that product property on it. But what I can do is use my properties of exponents that says that the cube root of three uh, times the square root of 10 to the fourth, I can distribute that fourth power to each of the two factors. And then I'm going to use the property that allows me to uh, pass exponents inside of roots. So that gives me the cube root of 3 to the 4th times the square root of 10 to the 4th. So we can do a little bit of cleaning up here. Uh, the cube root of 3 to the 4th, that has a perfect 3 in it, uh, a perfect cube in it that can come out as 3, and that would leave us with a cube root of 3. And then 10 to the uh, fourth power, well that's 10, we could recognize that as 10 squared squared, and so that's going to just simplify to be the number 10 squared or 100. So we're left with 300 cube root of three is how that cleans up after the fact. So folks, again, I'm gonna have you pause the video and try these two problems on your own. Okay, continuing down, I'd like to look at combining two, uh, combining radical terms. So here, just like we've seen before, if you have two like terms, if we have two terms that have a common factor, a times b plus c times b, notice both these terms have a common factor of b, so we can combine them, and this is how this works. The actual step is to do a factoring step, so we'd have a plus c times b, and that's how we, you know, usually what we do is we just say we're going to add together the constants, and that's how we're going to combine like terms. So let's see what we can do up above here. 
Um, first, let's simplify each of these radicals separately. So this is the uh, this is the radical minus five, and then uh, if we distribute our square root over both uh, factors there, and then we did some cleaning up, the square root of 12 could be written as two square root of three, and then the square root of x to the fifth is the same thing as, let's see here, the square root of x to the fifth, that's the same thing as the square root of x squared squared times x, which is the same thing as absolute value of x squared square root of x, which is the same thing as, because this is uh, the absolute value of something squared is always positive, we, just, we can just go ahead and simplify that to be x squared square root of x. So that simplifies to be x squared square root of x for that first term. For the second term, we uh, doing a similar process, we'd be left with a square root of three and then x squared square root of x. For this third term, the best we can do is leave this as the square root of 3x. So let's do some cleaning up of these first two terms. So I've got three terms here. These are my three terms, one, two, and three. Let's clean up the first two terms that we've simplified. And when we do so, we end up with negative 10x squared square root of 3x plus x squared square root of 3x plus 3 the square root of 3x. So notice that each one of these terms has a common factor of square root of 3x, so we can factor those out. So we get 10x squared plus x squared plus 1 times the square root of 3x. So I factored out that common factor that each one of these terms had. Then I can go ahead and combine like terms inside of here the way we were used to doing with polynomials. And so this gives me 1 minus 9x squared times the square root of 3x. So folks, I'm going to have you pause the video and try this problem on your own. If you're looking for simplifying each one of these radicals, yeah, be careful here because this is, a, this is a square root. Folks, in looking at my work, I think I want that to be a cube root there, so I'm going to change that for you um, so that these are all three uh, cube roots. Go ahead and simplify each one of those cube roots and then, if you're possible, combine like terms. Okay, so folks, we have one last skill, and this is a skill that you're probably a little familiar with. It's rationalizing denominators. When you have a rational expression or a fraction, um, we often wish to not have square roots in our denominators. There's various reasons for this. To be honest, one of the big reasons is just to get you to become better at manipulating square root expressions. So that's why a lot of times, if I'm doing my own uh, algebra calculations, I might actually leave the answer as 3 over the square root of 5. But it's customary to ask students to rationalize their denominators. And sometimes we need to do this. When you get into calculus, you will have to rationalize denominators in order to proceed um, using certain rules. So we need to get comfortable with this procedure. So the idea is, is we're going to take the radical term in the denominator and multiply it by something to give us a perfect nth root. So in this case, in the denominator, I have the square root of 5. If I had, instead of the square root of 5, the square root of a perfect square, then I could go ahead and simplify it. And so here, it's not too hard, uh, or it's not too challenging to get a perfect square. We're going to multiply this by the square root of 5 over the square root of 5. And I think this is probably the rationalizing of the denominator that you're most comfortable with. In the numerator, we get 3 square root of 5. And in the denominator, by my product property, I've got the square root of 5 times 5, which is equal to 3 square root of 5 over the square root of 5 squared. And that's equal to 3 square root of 5 over 5. And if you want to uh, skip from this step to this step, as we often do, you're welcome to do so. Uh, but I wanted to show you how this worked with our product properties. So let's do uh, Roman numeral 2 here because it's a little bit more complicated. Here we've got in our denominator not just a square root factor, but two, a factor of 2 as well. Now remember, our goal is simply to eliminate the square root in the denominator. So there's nothing that says we, we don't have to deal with this factor of 2 here. So again, our strategy will be to multiply this by the square root of 5 over the square root of 5. And this gives us 3 square root of 5 all over uh, 2 times the square root of 5 squared, which is 2 times 5. And so we end up with 3 square root of 5 
over 10 for that answer there. Now things are going to get a little bit different in these next couple of examples. In this case, I still have a sort of a pesky square root, not factor any longer, but a square root term. So notice here, this was 2 times the square root of 5. So we could just multiply by a factor of 5. That will be harder here. If I were to multiply uh, my denominator by a square root of 5, that would give me a perfect square for this term, but that would introduce a 2 square root of 5 for this term. So hopefully that makes sense. If you, if you don't believe me, go ahead and multiply this expression by the square root of 5 over the square root of 5 and see that you get 3 square root of 5 all over 2 square root of 5 plus 5. We did indeed fix this problem right here by multiplying by the square root of 5, but we introduced a new problem here uh, that we would need to deal with. So that's not going to be an optimal procedure. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to multiply both the numerator and the denominator by the conjugate of this denominator term. So the conjugate of the denominator is 2 minus the square root of 5, 2 minus the square root of 5. And the reason why we do this is that these are uh, differences. Uh, this, this, this expands out to be a difference of perfect squares, eliminating any of the problems. What do I mean by that? Let's actually FOIL that out. When we do 2 plus the square root of 5 times 2 minus the square root of 5, we get 2 times 2, which is 4. Then we get minus 2 square roots of 5. But then we get plus 2 square roots of 5. And then for our last, we'd have plus the square root of 5 squared. In our numerator, it's just kind of however the chips fall. So we end up with 6 minus 3 square root of 5. But notice what happens here. This is why we multiply by the conjugate of this term. Because the outer and inner terms now add out. And that's what we were hoping would happen. And that's why we specifically multiply by the conjugate to force those outer and inner terms to add out. So we're left with 6 minus 3 square roots of 5 all over uh, 4 plus 5, which we could simplify in one more step as 6 minus 3 square root of 5 all over 9. And there we've cleaned that up. So folks, for my last example, we're going to look at rationalizing this denominator. Here we have the cube root of 5. So it, notice that if we were to uh, multiply this by the cube root of 5 over the cube root of 5, that would give me the cube root of 25. But 25 isn't a perfect cube. So hopefully we see that. If you were to do that multiplication here, we'd get 2 times the cube root of 25. That's true. But that doesn't help me because I can't, I don't have a perfect cube here. So the trick is different when we have roots that are not uh, square roots. We're not going to multiply by the same expression here. Instead, the whole reason why we did that step to begin with, we multiplied by the square root of 5 over the square root of 5, was not because it, the rule is multiply it by itself. The rule is to multiply it by something that gives you a perfect square. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to multiply this by uh, the cube root of 5 squared over the cube root of 5 squared. So in the numerator, what we would end up with is 3 times the cube root of 25, and the denominator would give us 2 times the cube root of 125. And the benefit of that is that 125 is a perfect cube, and so now we can ra finish rationalizing that denominator, that is getting rid of the nth root in that denominator, and that would be 2 times 5, and so that leaves us with 3 cube root of 25 uh, divided by 10. And there we've rationalized that denominator. So folks, I'm going to let you try these on your own. You've got four more problems to work. And then I'll go ahead and down here I'll include a hyperlink of solutions for you. All right, folks, I'll see you uh, next time in the next pre-work. Take care.